So whether we like it or not, life is full of decisions. And one day, it's said that we make 35,000 choices. In fact, a new study by Cornell University suggests that each and every day, we make over 220 choices about food alone. Some of our choices clearly are inconsequential, yet some may be life-changing. And whenever we choose one thing, by nature, we're opting out or foregoing something else. In the process of making our 35,000 daily decisions, we rack up missed opportunities. Some meaningful, some not. American author H. Jackson Brown Jr. said, nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity. So please turn with me to Luke 16, 19. So I'd like to walk through a parable this afternoon and see what it has to say about missed opportunities. So a lot of lessons here, but I want to focus on the missed opportunities and the lessons within. So Luke 16, 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Life was not kind, clearly, to Lazarus. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being tormented, he, the rich, meaning the rich man, lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off at last, and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, and this is the rich man speaking, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. So the rich man lived a great life, and now he's in agony and asking for comfort. But Abraham said to the rich man, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none that may come from there to us. In other words, Abraham is telling the rich man, look, I know you're in a bad spot, you're in agony, I can't help you now. So he continued, the rich man, asking Abraham, that I beg you, Father, to send him, meaning Lazarus, to my father's house. I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they may also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said to the rich man, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham replied, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So in our story, we see that the rich man and his brothers did not listen to Moses and the prophets. And the consequences, they were dire. There's a lot of lessons here, but I want to focus on the theme of missed opportunities. Specifically, are we or could we be setting ourselves up to miss our ultimate opportunity? So the first lesson here, I think is pretty simple. Nobody can make us do it. 
Nobody can make us change our lives. Nobody can force us to become what we've been called to become. Notice what Abraham says to the rich man in our parable. When the rich man is in agony and he begs for Lazarus to go warn his brothers, Abraham responds by telling him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So it's our job clearly to respond to our calling. Philippians 2.12 tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't think the rich man and his brothers feared God, nor do they listen to Moses and the prophets. What about us? We have pastors, elders, deacons, life, hope, and truth, and a host of other resources preaching the word of God. But nobody can do it for us. We have to take responsibility for improving our own spiritual lives. So lesson number two from our parable, we must act with a sense of urgency. So we must act with a sense of urgency. So I think a lot of you know that my dad passed away late last year. So a few days before my dad passed, I got a message telling me that a coworker of mine had just lost her father. And I remember, I remember very clearly thinking, that's gotta be awful. That is tragic. That is so unfortunate. I can't imagine what she's going through. I remember thinking, dad exercises three days a week. He's not overweight. We have 20 years left with him. A few days later, I got a phone call. We don't know how much time we have. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. James 4, 13 and 14 compares life to a vapor. It's not substantial. It's here. It's gone. We're here today. We're gone quickly. We may not have much time, and even if we do, our time will pass quickly. It doesn't last. Today, it's a day of salvation. For you and I, it is the day of salvation. Today is the day. So what changes are we failing to make? What changes am I failing to make? in my spiritual life? What sins are we overlooking? So earlier this year, Mr. Servideo gave a message where he compared sins that we're choosing to overlook to the high places that remained in ancient Israel, even in the time of the good kings. So some of the kings, as you recall the story, they did a lot of good things. But most of the good kings in ancient Israel left the high places where sacrifices to other gods happened. Despite all the good, most of the kings left those high places. So what high places do we have? What high places do I have? It's easy to trick ourselves into thinking, I keep the Sabbath, the holy days, I tithe, do good things, And it's easy to overlook the things we don't address. But how much time do we have? How much time do we have to chop down our high places? The time is today. The time is now. This is our day of salvation. Thinking back to our parable, the rich man and his brothers, I get it, it was a parable, right? But they're gone. They're like the vapor that came and went a long time ago. Looking at the story, they could have listened, they could have heeded Moses and the prophets, but they chose not to respond. Quite a missed opportunity, and the consequences were dire. So we must act with a sense of urgency. In the last lesson I'd like to share from our parable, 
is don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Life is full of fool's gold. So why didn't the rich man and his brothers respond to Moses and the prophets? Well, the parable doesn't exactly tell us specifically why they didn't respond. But we could hypothesize that life was good, right? They feasted every day. They were rich. They were in need of nothing. They didn't listen. Can we be deceived? Life can be comfortable. It can be easy. And when it's easy, it's easy to let spiritual things slide. So what else is out there? What other forms of fool's gold exist? What about the wisdom of the world? It could be fool's gold, right? There's a lot of things out there that sound good, might contain some truth. There might be some wisdom in it, but it's fool's gold. And here's an example, a very modern example. So I really like Wikipedia. So wikipedia.org, it's sort of today's encyclopedia, as I would say. Great resource for almost anything you want to know about almost anything, and it's updated practically to the minute. So in preparing this message, I looked up Lazarus and the rich man on Wikipedia to see what they would say. So according to Wikipedia, there are five possible lessons or explanations for Lazarus and the rich man. First, it's just a historical event, just a bunch of stuff that happened. Second possible explanation, it's a story about a reversal of fortunes and concern for the poor. Third possible meaning is it's a warning to the Pharisees about their disbelief in the resurrection of Christ. Number four, it's a parable against the Sadducees. And lastly, it could be a parable regarding a new covenant. Those are all the philosophies that Wikipedia throws out to try to explain the meaning of Lazarus and the rich man. So on the contrary, if you go to Life, Hope, and Truth, there's a great article about Lazarus and the rich man, and this is the explanation, this is the key takeaway according to one of our websites, Life, Hope, and Truth. The takeaway is, We'd better heed the words that are found in the books that Moses wrote and in the books of the prophets. We must repent of breaking the laws of God. See the difference, right? Being generous to the poor, good lesson, don't deny it. Is there some element of truth in all the things on Wikipedia that try to explain Lazarus and the rich man? Maybe. But it's not the whole lesson. It's not the whole truth. The world doesn't have the whole answer. It's fool's gold because Wikipedia fails to address the larger point, the need and the call to repentance. That's how the wisdom of the world works. It's some truth, but it's not God's truth. It's not the whole story. It's fool's gold. So plenty of fool's gold. What about religion, right? A lot of churches will tell you to come as you are. That's big in mainstream churches. Come as you are. On the surface, sounds good. Sounds inviting. Sounds welcoming. Sounds easy. But that's it. It's hollow. There's no call to repentance. There's no call to change our lives. There's no call to grow in grace and knowledge and to set our sins aside and live a different life than the rest of the world. Come as you are sounds good, but it's fool's gold. We have to be vigilant enough not to fall victim to deception, to fool's gold. And of course, I'm clearly generalizing about a lot of messages out there. There's some truth, some elements of fact, some elements of uh, God's message out there. 
but we have to be savvy enough to avoid casting aside God's truth, to avoid casting aside God's way of life at the feet of fool's gold. As individuals who've been called by God, we have a remarkable opportunity to become first fruits in the kingdom of God, members of God's very family. We can't afford to be deceived. We can't afford to be lulled to sleep by the pleasures of this world like the rich man and his brothers. We've got to act with a sense of urgency. Nobody can do it for us. We must act before this vapor that is life passes us by. Because God's kingdom is an opportunity that is too great to be missed.